So uh, if you've ever read the Unified National Program, which is the overall program for the federal government and floodplain management, you'll find that there are two parts to floodplain management. One is property protection, which most everybody here is involved with because that's one of the key factors of the National Flood Insurance Program and the community rating system. But the other one, believe it or not, given equal status, is called protecting natural floodplain functions. What we're going to cover today is this other one, which actually does benefit protecting property. And normally uh, we talk in generalities, but we're going to focus on one part of it, and that's protecting natural, uh, the natural functions that support threatened and endangered species. Um, normally I'd say why it's important, but I'm going to take a leap of faith that you already know why we want to keep certain species from becoming extinct. That's the objective of the Threatened Endangered Species Act, which was passed by Congress in 1973. And its job was to have, see what the federal government could do to protect, prevent extinction. Uh, the act identified two agencies in the federal government, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service, which are typically called the services. And they were given responsibilities for identifying and overseeing uh, measures that help with conservation and recovery of the species. The Act also had a Section 7, and that says uh, this is a federal requirement, so all you other federal agencies besides these two, you are hereby charged with doing everything you can within your authority to help protect and help recover threatened and endangered species. So you're a federal agency, and um, you have obviously in the federal agency as a FEMA, and so FEMA is faced with this question of, okay, we got this assignment under Section 7, what do we do? Well, as any good federal agency does, you form a committee. And a Section 7A1 interagency work group was formed and started working about four, four years ago to see what FEMA could do with advice from Fish and Wildlife and NIMPS. So the group came up with three major approaches. The first is a website to help people learn about uh, threatened and endangered species and related FEMA programs. The second is a thing called FRESH, which is an acronym we'll get to. And the third, which is probably why most of you are here, is you also want to get CRS credit to encourage communities to take steps to protect the species. So let me go through these, and we'll spend the most time on the last one, of course, but let's start with the conservation website. Uh, it is on FEMA.gov. I'm assuming just about everybody here has been to FEMA.gov. When you go to that site, you will get a menu, and you want to pick the floods and maps uh, piece of the menu because that's what most floodplain managers are focusing on. And you'll get this larger sub-menu, and you go down the floodplain management part and you'll see floodplains and wildlife conservation. That's the new site courtesy of this working group. Hit that and you will get another menu of course and it starts with what are the benefits of natural floodplains and protecting them. And it gets into some rationale and good things. You've probably seen some of this before. It's good to see a summary particularly if you are talking about starting some new programs and you want to convince certain people that it's a good idea. Uh, scroll down some more and you will see some communities that are already there and summaries of the things they have done um, in nice, short, simple terms and give you some, some more ideas. But it also shows how lots of communities around the country are doing things in their floodplain management programs to protect threatened and endangered species. Uh, back up to that menu, you'll notice one of the things talks about in reducing insurance costs. Now, this should catch people's attention. How do you think you're going to reduce insurance costs by protecting natural floodplains? It's the community rating system. That is what uh, is focused on in this section and talks about things that the community rating system can do uh, and particularly give credit. Uh, there is a publication identified here. This link will get you this document, which has been around a few years, that is kind of like a um, kinder, gentler coordinator's manual. It's uh, shorter, less acronyms, sweeter. What it does is it tells the CRS coordinator how they can get credit for protecting natural floodplain functions, and it tells 
people in the business of protecting natural floodplain functions, how the CRS can help them. So it's kind of introductory for both both areas. Uh, you'll notice that you can get it on crsresources.org. I hope everybody here is familiar with that website. Look under the manual menu. But you'll also notice that it's in 2018. Now, it's still good for those CRS activities that are listed. Those are all still there. Those didn't change with more recent publications. But it does not include what we're going to talk about today, the newer stuff that came out since then. Um, it'll get a, updated one of these days, and you'll get a notice of that in the newsletter. So that's the conservation website. <clears throat> Let's talk about FRESH. Uh, FRESH is a nice acronym for Flood Risk and Endangered Species Habitat. It is a mapping system that FEMA has put up there a couple of years ago. And to get to it, you can see back on our floodplains and wildlife conservation website in the menu, there is a fresh mapping tool. If you hit that, you will get the page on the fresh mapping tool. What I recommend is start at the bottom. Scroll down to the bottom of that page, and you will see a link to a user's guide for fresh. It's only about nine pages long, so you might want to just download that and keep it handy when you're working in fresh. Then you can scroll back up and you will see the link to Fresh. Once you hit that link, of course, you can always save it on your, on your favorites and go straight there. <clears throat> when you do, you will get this home screen where it shows the entire country, um, at least the lower 48. But the key thing is put in your community in, up here on the, on the top of the screen. We're going to work with Gloucester County, Virginia today and show you how they used it. Uh, but you can do it with your community at any time. It'll take you to your community of interest. And the first thing you want to do is identify what's called the area of interest. Um, for most cases, it's going to be your corporate limits. In some cases, it may be a sub-area. In some cases, it may want to include extraterritorial jurisdiction. But uh, you want to outline where you want to focus your attention. So that was done. We've outlined Gloucester County's uh, corporate limits. And we want to find a couple of things out. Uh, the first is what species have range in your community? Uh, what listed, threatened, and endangered species have range in your community? So range is a technical term. Um, it's a general geographical area. It's where the species could be found when the species was put on the list. And some of those were done soon after 1973, a good number 40 years ago. So it may not be up to date or the latest, but it's the best place to start. So using FRESH and your area of interest, you will get a list of the species with range in that area of interest. It will also tell you their status and which agency put that species on the list. Uh, you'll probably see, as you see here, some species you've never heard of. And I just want to underline one called the sensitive joint vetch. When I first saw that, I didn't know if that was an insect or a plant or a fish or what. And you really kind of can't tell from right there. But we'll get back to the sensitive joint vetch. Some of these you have seen or probably heard of before, um, like the bat and the sturgeons. So there are eight on the list, and these are eight species that have been listed as either threatened or endangered, or as you can see, are being proposed for being listed by the two agencies. Um, this is what you want to start with when you do your CRS work. Um, you may want to add more that don't come from fresh, like state-listed species. But as a minimum, we want to start with this. And that is the species that have range in your community. Um, another term that you probably have heard of is critical habitat. Now, this is a much more specific area. Um, it's taken a bit more work to verify that this is where uh, this particular area identified is very important to this species. And to get listed and actually get uh, a critical habitat mapped, it actually goes through and ends up uh, publishing in the Federal Register. 
So there's not as many of these areas. They're usually smaller, um, but uh, they're more important for the species. Um, so Fresh will show you where that is too, and I'm going to show you right here for Gloucester County. Maybe that was too quick, but the Atlantic sturgeon has critical habitat, and it shows up as uh, lots of areas that are linear, like rivers, will show up as a line as opposed to an area being mapped. So you can see the dark purple line appearing here when we ask Fresh, show me where the critical habitat is for the Atlantic sturgeon. So let's uh, zoom in and take a little closer look at what you can really find out with Fresh. So we're going to take a piece of Gloucester County, this particular area along the York River, uh, blow it up, and you'll notice on the map that there's a good amount of that symbol that shows you there's marshland or wetlands. Um, let's talk about the sensitive joint vetch. Uh, if you find out a little more about it, you'll realize that it is a flower. And as this particular picture shows, it seems to like water. So maybe it would be in the floodplain, maybe it would be in the marshland. Let's ask Fresh. So we ask Fresh, OK, we know we've got a sensitive joint fetch somewhere. Where is it? Where is the range? And it produces a map like this. Most of the species you bump into in your community will have what's called countywide range. That means they didn't get specific enough or that species really does live everywhere in your county. Um, we are going to want to focus for floodplain management on those species that are connected to the floodplain. And obviously from this map, uh, it looks like sensitive joint vetch is because it seems to show up in marshes and along the water. Uh, Fresh also will show us where the natural, um, where the special flood hazard area is. Uh, they have linked it to the National Flood Hazard Layer, which you can use online on FEMA's website. And again, push the right button on the menus, and it'll show you where the floodplain is with the A zones showing as blue and the shaded X zones showing as brown here. So what do you want to do? Obviously, you want to do both. Can you show me both the floodplain and the range for the sensitive joint vetch at the same time? Yes, it can. And you don't need to be a genius to see, I think this species is related to the floodplain. I think our floodplain management program probably would have an impact on the conservation and recovery of this species because they live in the area we want to protect and manage. So that's what FRESH can do for you. It provides information. What we did as part of those uh, last four years of work on that interagency work group was interview 36 CRS communities that had lots of threatened and endangered species in their corporate limits. And we talked it over with them, did some homework on what species were there, um, and uh, for sure talk to all the CRS coordinators, but we also talked to other people in the community staff. And one of the things we found is if you took a list of CRS credits that uh, provide credit related to threatened and endangered species, obviously, for example, preserving critical habitat or doing outreach programs that tell people about threatened and endangered species and what could be done, what we found is that a lot of the communities are doing something. Here of the 36, you could see 33 have open space in the floodplain. But they're not all getting a lot of credit. Uh, for example, preserving critical habitat. 21 communities are doing it, but only six were actually getting CRS credit for it. So there seemed to be a disconnect between uh, the fact that the communities had threatened and endangered species. They were doing some things, but the CRS wasn't reflecting it. So it was concluded that probably the problem is the CRS coordinator doesn't know that much about the technical aspects of conserving and recovery for threatened and endangered species. And probably the naturalists, the park people uh, in the community or in the local government probably don't know much about CRS. So the work group and FEMA 
uh, looked at what do we got. Well, what we got is a coordinator's manual, which, as you know, is really fun to read. And in it are a few pages about protecting natural floodplain functions, but um, kind of generic stuff and not specifically oriented toward threatened and endangered species. So changes were made, and they came out in the addendum that came out uh, last year in January to the coordinator's manual, and two major changes were done. The first was let's beef up that attention to threatened and endangered species. So the section that covers natural floodplain functions now includes a separate section on threatened and endangered species, identifying 19 of the 94 elements in the CRS where you can get credit. There are 19 or 20 percent of them are can be uh, Credited, can credit actions related to threatening, threatened and endangered species. So that's providing more information, especially for the CRS coordinator. The other thing that's probably much more interest to you is there is new credit in the manual. Now there was a problem of coming up with new credits in when you weren't coming up with a new manual. And so uh, what the geniuses did was saying, hey, we already have a credit for natural floodplain functions planning. Let's just show some new ways to get that credit, particularly because there weren't that many communities getting NFP credit in the country. So it was kind of sitting there without people taking advantage of it. So two new credits under NFP. The first is to do a floodplain species assessment. And the idea behind that is you find out in your community what are the threatened and endangered species that have range here. How does that relate to our floodplain? Are there some species like the sensitive joint vetch that are really uh, floodplain related? And uh, what are we doing about it? What particularly are we doing? What could we do, especially if it got CRS credit? So if you do one of those, put that together, you could get credit for an assessment. Once you do the assessment, you can say, well, now I know. I know what's out there and what we could do. Let's do a plan of doing something. And so you can get credit for a floodplain species plan, which comes up with activities and action items related to protecting threatened and endangered species that also get CRS credit. So NFP has a new formula. You can get 15 points for your assessment. If you have got a good assessment, you can proceed and do a plan for 85 points, and you could get um, a max of 100 points, which is the maximum under Natural Floodplain Functions Plan. So that is in effect now without actually publishing a new manual, but it is in the addendum. The addendum has all of two pages explaining this. It's very specific about how you get the credit. It doesn't tell you how to produce a plan or an assessment. So we have come up with a supplement or a guidance document on how to do a plan and how to do an assessment. And uh, that is available free on crsresources.org. Since it's in the 510 credit for planning, it's in the 500 series uh, on your menus for uh, crsresources.org. In addition to the guidance, there are three community plans and assessments that were done by these communities. Um, these are folks that we had interviewed, and then we worked with them, and they developed an assessment and a plan for them. And notice the first one is actually a multi-jurisdiction assessment and plan when two neighboring counties work together on it. What I recommend very strongly is download all four of these documents if you're interested in doing stuff. There's the step-by-step -step guidance in the, guid in the guidance on the left, and then there's real examples, lots of good language in the three example plans. So let's open up the document on the left and look at the table of contents. And I've already given away the fact that this is a step-by-step -step guide. As with other plans in the CRS and the Program for Public Information, for example, what CRS really wants to see is something that works well for your community. And so it can't tell you, be sure you do this, be sure you do that. What it can tell you is, if you want the credit, follow a good planning process. And that's where the step-by-step -step shows you what the process is. If you do these things, you'll produce something pretty useful for your community. 
So let's start with step one. We're going to spend most of our time on the assessment because you've got to do that first before you get into the plan. So we start with step one, and the first thing is to identify your listed species. And that, of course, is where you want to go back to fresh. And when you do that, you saw that table we did for Gloucester County. This is the table for Monroe, Washington. And it will tell you the species that are listed as threatened, endangered, and proposed by the two services with range in your community. And in the case of Monroe, in this example, <clears throat> you have 11 species. Uh, Gloucester County had eight. Um, you may get some number from five. We have seen large counties, um, as many as 40 species. But you need to start with that list. <clears throat> So you got the list. Step two is, well, where are these species? Where's their range? Where's their critical habitat? As I said, most of the species listed are countywide. They cover large areas or potentially cover large areas. But when you work with fresh, you will be able to find which species are not countywide, but actually are related to a particular area, like the sensitive joint vetch. In Monroe's case, there were two species with critical habitat identified by um, both Fish and Wildlife and the other by National Marine Fisheries, the bull trout by Fish and Wildlife and the Chinook salmon. And not surprisingly, they are fish and their critical habitat is the water, specifically the rivers that run through Monroe. So it came out as a linear delineation. Now, you want to ask the question, is this specifically mapped range or critical habitat related to the floodplain? And of course, when you realize that they're rivers, it's kind of a no-brainer, and the answer is yes. <clears throat> it may be related to the floodplain, but we also wanted to know, how, how about open space in the floodplain? We know that's the best kind of habitat. So is there a relation there, too? So here's where Monroe used its own open space maps that it prepared for CRS credit. <clears throat> and you can see that actually Monroe has a heck of a lot of open space in the floodplain. And a lot of the critical habitat, a lot of the streams, border on open space owned by the city. So this tells you there's a lot of potential for things that Monroe can do to help these two species in particular. So step three is, well, what are you doing? for threatened and endangered species. And I mentioned there are 19 elements in the credit in the CRS manual related to threatened and endangered species. And so they're listed in the guidance document. Table 2 of the guidance document is what you're looking at here. And it lists the, spe lists the uh, element. And it would like you to answer uh, several questions. The first, are you doing this? And it doesn't matter if you're getting CRS credit, are you doing it? Yes or no, or maybe you're not really sure. But if you are doing it, are you getting CRS credit? And is it feasible to get more credit? Or if you're not doing it, is it feasible to start doing it? So this is Monroe's answers. You notice they are not doing this particular element in Activity 320 Map Information Service. They are doing outreach. Um, and, but they're being credited well. This uh, is a little footnote that says, we are doing um, outreach projects. We are doing a library. We're doing a website. All of them are covering some topic under natural floodplain functions, but not necessarily related to threatened and endangered species. So is it feasible for you to do it or get more points? And the answers for those are yes, if we reword our messages to be appropriate or related to natural, not excuse me, not natural floodplain functions, but to specifically to threatened and endangered species, um, specifically the species in our community. Um, <clears throat> the examples we've had um, that I, we've reviewed and the three examples online, um, all use this table and have short notes here, but they also all have about a paragraph of narrative for each element that they want to explain in a bit more detail. So that's the three things we want to know for you. What are your species? 
where are they in relation to the floodplain, and what are you doing in the CRS that could help them? Step four is to identify other agencies and organizations that uh, know a lot more about this than you do and might already have programs related to those species. At a minimum, you need to identify the specific offices of Fish and Wildlife for your area, National Marine Fisheries for your area, and I should note a lot of inland areas in the country will not have any species identified by NIMPS, so you don't have to worry about that. NIMPS focuses on species in the ocean or that live part of their time in the ocean and part of their time upriver. Need to identify your FEMA regional CRS coordinator who will tell you who in the FEMA regional office is the person that deals with species, threatened and endangered species. And every state has an agency related to these also, usually called a fish and wildlife or a wildlife and fisheries or some similar names like that. So find the offices, the addresses, or email addresses or whatever of the right office dealing with threatened and endangered species. In addition, you've got a lot of local and private organizations concerned, especially private organizations like the Sierra Club, um, Nature Conservancy, the Audubon Society, uh, and local organizations. Generally, if you've ever issued a permit in the floodplain, you probably already know the environmental groups who are concerned about that. But find out who these folks are and get their addresses and uh, names so that you can do step five, which is take the draft you've done so far and send it to them and ask for their feedback. There is in the guidance document uh, both guidance on how to find the agencies, those four that you have to find, and um, an example letter that you could send them. And that letter is focuses on four things you'd like to know from them. The first is, here's our list. Is this really appropriate? Are these species really were in our community? Uh, should we worry about them, or is there something missing? Uh, second, are there things you think are really important for those species or recovery actions? Um, is there something big going on these days? Is there something vital for a particular species? What do you, with your knowledge and activities, think should be really important things to pursue? This is especially important if you end up with a list of 40 species or a large number of species. You really want to kind of make it more manageable and trim down to what's really important. Third question you want to ask them is, have you got any more information on these? Do you have anything that can tell us about the threats and their preferred habitats and things like that? And then the fourth is, if we uh, do something, um, are there things you could help us with, or would you have any priority projects you would like us to do? Um, we've seen the feedback we've gotten from these. Obviously, you may never hear from some of the folks you send the, the letter to, um, or you may hear lots of stuff. And we've seen some really good feedback, really helpful feedback. Um, one of the more common things you'll get is some statements by the experts, don't worry about these guys, they don't live in your area. Um, that will help you quite a bit. Others will say, we are the Audubon Society, obviously we care about threatened birds, uh, but we have this particular program or this particular species that we're doing a lot with right now, and you could sure help us. We're also seeing agencies say, I can't do a lot, we're limited in staff, but boy, do we have handouts and other materials. If you want to do an outreach project, we can supply you with, with flyers, for example. And we've seen folks who are willing to assist. So you'll get a variety of different of feedback and uh, some no feedback from some of them, but uh, usually it's been very helpful. While you're sending it to those folks, we have a strong recommendation for submitting a CRS request for courtesy review. What that is, is take your draft, doesn't matter how marked up it is or whatever, the same thing you sent those other folks, send it to your ISO CRS specialist and say, can I get a courtesy review? 
If you don't know who your specialist is, you can go to crs.resources.org and at the 100 menu, it'll tell you who they are. The specialist will forward it on to the technical reviewer for this activity, and the technical reviewer will give you feedback. Obviously, it's not a score or anything because you haven't finished it, but we'll tell you if you're on the right track, if you're missing something important. Won't tell you anything about the species necessarily, but we'll say for CRS credit, you need to make sure you do this and that or you're missing something. The technical reviewers are currently myself and Wes Shaw, who is on the the line, and we can tell you we will definitely give it attention and give you feedback within a couple of weeks as soon as we can. And it's proven to be very useful because just about every draft we see could use a tweaking here or there to get the credit. You don't want to find out when you're all done that you missed something. So let's go to step six, which is prepare the final assessment. So you need to take the feedback that you're getting and revise what you drafted. And this is Monroe's. This is very interesting. So here's the 11 species that Monroe got from FreshMap. Um, and as far as Monroe people knew, these were all equally valuable species, uh, equally appropriate for the city. The experts knew better. Uh, they said, okay, for the Canada lynx, um, that creature lives in the forest and eats hares, and you don't have forests in your city. Similarly, wolves travel in packs, and they stay away from cities. So for the city of Monroe, we would recommend spending time on the trout and the salmon as opposed to these others. And that's what they did for the other species, too. The murrelet, it grows in old-growth forest, which is in the county, but not in the city. And once it's old enough to fly, they go off into the salt water, and you don't see them in the city. The wolverine likes to live in higher elevations than the city. Spotted frog hasn't been seen in your area for a long time. Same with the horned lark. And the cuckoo um, likes forests with dense cover. And again, you're not going to find that in the city. So what happens in Monroe is they went from 11 various species to four priority species, all of whom happen to be fish. So they are all related to floodplain, and they all probably have very similar recovery actions. So you want to do that and revise your report accordingly. After you've done that, send it to your governing body. They do not have to act. They don't have to vote on it. They just have to say thank you. Uh, they don't even have to do that, actually, but they just have to receive it. Send a courtesy copy to your reviewers. They helped you out, so tell them you took their advice and here's how the results are. Um, sometimes send it to your specialist, either now or at the next cycle visit or whatever, but eventually you'll get the 15 points after the specialist sends it to the technical reviewer. The big thing you want to do now, okay, you got 15 points, you're happy and everything. big thing you want to do now, though, is do you want to prepare a full-pledged plan? So if so, you say, yes, let's see what's going to be involved. Go back to your guidance document. Go back to the table of contents. Go back to step seven, which is do some more homework on these species. Now, in Monroe's case, it's down to four. The best and easiest place to look is in the recovery plan. And the uh, Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries, on their websites, they'll identify where the recovery plans are. They prepared them. They've published them. Not every species has one. Uh, some have revised recovery plans. Some have status reports. You may have to do a little poking around to find the best document on the species. Um, they'll look different, but the one thing they have in common is a very similar table of contents. There's two things you want to find out from the recovery plan. The first is, what's the problem here? Why is this species endangered? What are the threats? And secondly, what can be done about it? That's called recovery tasks. So just about every recovery plan will have the list of recovery tasks. They're going to be a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, there are a lot of the recovery tasks involve research, monitoring a species, improving habitat in a particular area, 
um, recovery tasks for some of the national marine fisheries species have been related to federal fishing regulations, um, what kind of nets you can use. Uh, some of them also involve species that migrate to other countries. Um, one of them that I looked at, for example, one of the recovery tasks involved a treaty with Mexico. So some of those tasks are not going to be something you as a community can do. So read through them and you'll be able to figure out which ones are appropriate. Here's the piping plover recovery plan. There's a task that says discourage construction in areas that will degrade their habitat. Well, aren't you focusing on species that relate to the floodplain? Don't you manage a program that manages construction or even in, uh, prohibits it in certain areas? Uh, so following up on this recovery plan, uh, recovery action could be appropriate for your community. Um, just about every recovery plan will have some kind of public information aspect. And I assume you're all familiar with all the credits under the 300 series for public information programs that uh, you may be able to get credit for and also get assistance from some of those agencies you contacted. In your species plan, you should be having a page or so on each of your species that you're going to work on. This should be a summary of the key factors um, like the habitat, the threats to the species from the recovery plans, and the recovery measures that the plans recommend that would be appropriate for you all. Monroe did this since they had, as we mentioned earlier, um, four species that were all fish. As part of their research, they decided, listen, um, we don't need to write four sets of recovery measures. We can summarize them because they're all pretty similar. Um, and some of these are pretty obvious. If you want to protect fish, you want to protect their water. You want to, for example, prevent extreme fluctuations in the flow. And that's what your stormwater management program is designed to do. Um, you want to provide cover along the shoreline, and don't forget Monroe owned a lot of the shoreline, still does. You want to educate people so you can see uh, the kinds of recovery measures that you would want to pick out of all those plans that would be appropriate for local government. I want to identify one in particular that uh, this term large woody debris, it's a pretty common term uh, up in the northwest, but it's an important thing for protecting species. So step eight is after you've done all this review, what's the best thing your community could do? Which would be appropriate recovery action items? Uh, how do you do that? Well, why don't you take those 19 elements that get CRS credit and like you did in the assessment, identify does any of them line up with some of these recovery actions that are in the recovery plans? And here's a real thing that Monroe did. This is from Monroe's outreach project to its community. Um, goes out to everybody, I think, with the monthly water bill once a year. And that folder, that flyer they had, says for its natural floodplain functions credit, keep the trash out of the streams, keep the trash out of the rivers, keep your property clear of debris. Now, if you read that and you didn't know much about endangered species, you would say, okay, i got to pull everything out of my channel. I'm going to grab all the old tires that are down there in the shopping carts. And those trees that fell down, i got to pull them out because that's what the city says. And then you realize, wait a minute, we want large woody debris. Remember that? So Monroe discovered in this review that it was telling people the opposite of what they should do. And so what is its action item? For our outreach projects, we're going to change the message for natural floodplain functions. Don't cut those shade trees along the banks. They help keep the water cooler and help threaten species. So that's the kind of action you would do for your 19 activities or whatever level of you want to get involved in. So Monroe did check every activity. Some of them weren't rele relevant. Some of them didn't need to be changed. But they came up with an action item. They came up with who's going to do it, when's it going to be done, do you need any money? If so, where's it going to come from? And who can help? Those are things you'll see in every CRS plan. 
uh, CRS credited plans want to see actions and very specific who's going to do it and when it's going to be done. So statements like it is hereby the policy of the city council that we want to protect threatened and endangered species aren't actions, aren't action items worthy of credit. Um, they may be something you want to recommend and do it here, but you probably wouldn't get credit. So we recommend focusing on specific actions that get credited. And all three of the example plans on the website have such uh, setups. Uh, only Monroe put a table on, the rest are all in, in uh, narrative form. So step nine, put all that together in a plan, complete it as a draft, and guess what? How about circulating it back to the same people who gave you feedback earlier? You asked them for general information before, and now you've got some much more specific. I uh, get their feedback, and in particular, you may discover some of those agencies would be glad to help you implement some of those actions. While you're doing that, why don't you go for another courtesy review, send it back up to your specialist, to get reviewed by the technical reviewers, get feedback, do you need to do any changes specifically if you want to get the credit. Get all that together, revise your document, and finalize it. Take your final version and step 10 and give it to your city council or county commission to get adopted. Unlike the assessment, which you just give them for information, this has to be specifically adopted. Um, as with any other plan that wants to get credit in the CRS. As a courtesy, send it to the reviewers that this is the final version. Thank you for your help. We want to keep helping us. Send it to your specialist uh, or wait for your next uh, cycle visit. And eventually, you will get it approved and collect the 1585 points. So you're finished, right? You know, I wouldn't ask that question if the answer was simple. There's a step 11. Again, as with all CRS plans, you have to do some implementation. You need to do the actions, follow your timetable, or if not, when you do your annual evaluation report, tell what the changes are need to be, why you aren't accomplishing it on schedule, um, and send that report to your governing body, and include it with your annual recertification. So these are the same things you're doing for a hazard mitigation plan for a uh, program for public information, uh, for a, a repetitive loss plan, all of the plans at CRS credits, they all have a similar approach. So we have CRS credit is the third of the three things that are being done uh, under that work group. We've covered the three main things in the work groups produced for the Endangered Species Act. Um, there's now a website on FEMA.gov that can help you with information on um, conservation and recovery of threatened and endangered species and links to both the uh, CRS credits and background information and also to FreshMap. We've covered FreshMap and what it can do for you. Whether you want to do a species assessment or not, it can still be a very helpful tool for other parts of your floodplain management program. And then we've covered the uh, species assessment and a little bit about the plan.